Just a couple points I would like to, to reinforce the political before I get down into the um, details of how we actually move forward. Uh, so first point is geography counts. That's why Alaska is so important to missile defense of our nation, period. Because only from Alaska do you have the capability of defending against attacks out of the east or attacks out of the west. Back in the day, we were originally concerned only about North Korea. But we always wanted to ensure inside the program that we had the residual capability to be able to defend our country from the east. And so today there are things like uh, a communications facility at Fort Drum that just further provide us that capability. So geography counts in this game. Second point, look at the world today. What do we have going on in the world? And who is the target? Look in Ukraine. The target are not maneuver forces of missiles. The target's the civilian population, the civilian infrastructure, the telecom networks, the energy grid, apartment buildings to seed terror. Look at what happened when the, the Russians moved into Chechnya. Same thing. What was the target? Not the maneuver forces. What was the target in Israel? Look at where Hezbollah and Hamas are both targeting the use of missiles and rockets today on the civilian population, on the civilian infrastructure. And look at the United States. If that's the precedent that's being set out there, what's going to be the target for somebody? Well, one could argue that our deferent, deterrent posture with our ICBMs sea-based, land-based, and our bomber force provides a tremendous deterrent, and that is all true. What if deterrence fails? What do I mean by that? What if somebody launches a single ICBM at ADAC? What are we going to do? Are, are we in a position where pick a country, are we going to respond with an overwhelming nuclear attack on a country that shoots at ADAC? I don't think so. And what GMD provides to our country is options for our decision makers. All of a sudden, if you've got the ability to defend and take down a small attack, all of a sudden, You've provided our decision makers options. They don't have to respond with a massive retaliation. And so that's a very important piece of the puzzle that most people really don't pay a lot of attention to, but it's critical in today's world. So uh, just trying to reinforce what Mead and, and Ricky talked about and why it's important. So let me take you back uh, on a trip down memory lane for a second. Uh, I joined GMD in October of 2001. Uh, we had just suffered the, uh, the attack on the World Trade Center, on the Pentagon, and in Pennsylvania where the, the, the passengers took over the aircraft. And as part of the historical perspective of all of this, President Bush turns to Secretary Rumsfeld at the time and says, tell me where else we're vulnerable. Rumsfeld and crew study it, use all the previous studies that had been done, and said, these North Koreans are making a lot of very aggressive rhetoric on attacking the United States. And we're vulnerable, because right now today, John Hawley's terminology, all we can do is say, duck, here they come, if they shoot at us. We've got great advanced warning. We've got the early warning radars and everything out there. We can see them coming, but we haven't got a way to defend ourselves. So that then, that was the trigger point for withdrawing from the ABM treaty. And so as we, when we withdrew in December, we really didn't withdraw. 
withdrawal, rather. You had to give a six month notification period. And so we actually did not withdraw from the ADM treaty until June. Well, so what? Quoting Mead, there are two seasons in Alaska, winter and construction season. And winter takes up most of the year. So we couldn't start building anything at Fort Greeley until June of 2002. Now the good news is uh, SDIO, BMDO, MDA had been working together to put together a plan and an architecture on how to defend the United States. And so when we decided to withdraw from the ABM treaty, Secretary Rumsfeld said, okay, what can you do? Well, we're still in the middle of a development program and we still had to develop the system. Hit to kill, going back to Mead's point, was still a subject of great discussion at that point in time. We had people, Ted Postel, the Union of Concerned Scientists and others, testifying in Congress that this was technically impossible to achieve. Nobody thought it was feasible. You couldn't do this hit to kill stuff, no way. Well, we had to finish development because we didn't have enough data to really refute that argument initially. And so that was a piece of the puzzle. Fast forward, we withdraw from the ABM treaty or announce our withdrawal in December. Then we've got to move forward. Um, and so in January, well, in December, we basically withdrew in order to build what was termed a test bed. So we were gonna build the infrastructure similar to what we have today, similar, not the same. And we're gonna test things, not launching out of uh, Greeley, but testing a lot of things. In those days, we launched our test program, uh, conducted the, inter or launched the interceptor out of Kwajalein and the targets out of Kodiak. And so we, we used that kind of a geometry, which was very similar to what we would see with an attack. And so the test bed was what we withdrew from the ABM treaty to do. Well, in January of that year, the president and Secretary Rumsfeld got together and said, I don't like this idea of a test bed. Uh, we're going to build an operational system. And so on the 6th of January, I got called up to DC and I was told that we're gonna give you $10 billion for the program. And that's $2,001, not inflated. We're gonna give you $10 billion. You will go operational by 30 September, 2004 and Oh, by the way, you're in complete development of this system. You gotta prove that it's gonna work. And to do that, in the next 12 months, you're gonna fly four intercept flight tests. Just to calibrate everybody, in those days, an intercept flight test cost about $250 million a copy because of all the stuff that went into that. And so um, I had a polite discussion with some very, very senior people and uh, said, it's not enough time. That's 33 months away, can't do it. Uh, we've got to be able to do all this development and then we would sequentially move into building the system and everything. And at that point, correct me where I stray, the only thing we had at Fort Greeley in the missile defense complex was a wellhead. Nothing else, nothing else. And so I said, got to do all this construction stuff too. And so um, I was told I wasn't listening. Um, <laughs> that I had until the 30th of September of 2004 and I will go operational again. So not being real smart, I tried again and listed all the reasons why I needed more time and margin in the program. And for the second time, I was told I was not listening. Um, whereupon I am trainable, so I migrated in to say, okay, 
Um, we'll do the best we can. And that's what they asked for. So there were a couple practical things coming out of that. The first thing was, since we didn't, did not have any defensive capability for our country, something was better than nothing. So what we had was a scenario where we had a capabilities-based program. Now, everybody inside the Pentagon thought we were going to be a bunch of wild people and abuse that mercilessly. Uh, not true. Uh, but we had a lot more flexibility as a result of that. NORTHCOM had developed requirements for us, and Army SMDC fed that in. But we had flexibility to make the trade-offs where we needed to make the trade-offs on a routine basis. When we encountered a technical problem, we took that technical problem, sat down, worked the problem, came up with alternatives, and then typically I went and sat with the um, the U.S. Army, in those days they called him a trade ops system manager, uh, and the deputy commander, Lieutenant General Ed Anderson, out of NORTHCOM at the time, and worked the problem with them. So we didn't have a set of rigid requirements that we never deviated from, that in normal acquisition programs, and I've been an Army program manager a number of times for some programs that are in the news today, uh, where you spend the last 20% of your budget trying to get 1% of the requirements met. That's not the way we needed to do this because we were on a timeline because our country was at risk. We could not afford to let that happen. So we worked the problem with our users routinely. Now, Mead also mentioned the, the user. Who's the user? Well. Here in Alaska, you got the uh, Alaska National Guard, and then you've also got the National Guard down in Colorado at Shriver Space Force Base. So the Army put up the people, really the National Guard, but the Army put up the people. They put up no money, not a penny. So everything from the nine millimeters that the uh, MP company out at Greeley use to uh, Humvees and everything else, which is not traditional uh, for to spend R&D money on, um, we bought it. We bought the whole infrastructure for the uh, uh, 49th Battalion. An important lesson was learned there, though. I would typically have violated the law had I done that except having worked with Senator Stevens and Senator Inouye, uh, we had a line in our congressional authorization that said, you can use research and development money to do anything you want, anything you need to use it for to accomplish the mission. So things like buying nine millimeters, that was within the budget. Military construction, which is normally a very rigid, oh, I only spent $500 million of, dollars of that uh, out at uh, Fort Greeley in terms of the Milcon piece of the puzzle. Uh, so we had a lot more flexibility, but to a point that was made by Meade also, how we got that flexibility? One sentence in the defense authorization bill. That's all it took. And we had the flexibility to legally change the color of money without having to go through the normal reprogramming process inside the Pentagon where when you achieve a certain threshold, uh, you've got to go through the formal process. And typically takes two to three to months or so to reprogram colors of money. We were able to do that real time today. And the decision authority, frankly, was me, which was a little scary too. Uh, so having a capabilities-based program and having flexibility to do a lot of things allowed us to go very fast. Flight testing. While we were building everything here, and I'll get back to building in a second, we had to do the flight testing. So we were given a mission to fly four in the next 12 months. We threw five in the next 14 months. And that demonstrated that we had 
the right technology to be able to do it. Now, though that was against realistic at the time, threat targets in the presence of countermeasures. A lot that second point gets dropped most of the time when people talk about it. But they were not the targets that we've got today. And they were not the level of countermeasures we have today. So we had a little bit easier task, but we also just had prototypes. And as we look forward today, having the capability to deal with today's threat, that I'm sure uh, both Northcom, MDA, and Lockheed will all talk about, having the ability in terms of the next generation of interceptors, that's critical to us. We've got to keep pace with the threat. It is not a static game. And as Ricky mentioned, ICBM launch earlier this week out of China, no notice ICBM launch. I'd like to talk to our Northcom reps on that one and uh, afterward. No notice to the US. That's a problem. Now we have no, they had no requirement to notify us because we have no arms control arrangements in place. The threat's getting worse. We have got to continue to keep pace with the threat. It's just that simple. And then the last point I would like to make is I was given a lot of trust, but trust is a two-way street. I had a lot of decision authority that frankly was a bit unusual, even in those days. And I was trusted to deliver, but at the same time, trust is a two-way street. As I noted before, I worked very closely with General Anderson out of Northcom. I worked closely with uh, General Horn out of TRADOC. I worked closely with Senator Stevens. I worked closely with Senator Inouye. I worked closely with uh, Representative Young, too. I went in his office one time. He had so many heads on the wall, I was worried that mine was going to be one of them eventually. <laughs> um, but if you're working with the various stakeholders, then you can make progress and you can get done what needs to get to uh, be accomplished. And so what we ended up with is about 10,000 people, government and industry, working on this particular program. And every one of those fine Americans put in 365, 24 seven, it's as simple as that. They knew that they were at risk. Now in Alaska, we had some unique construction challenges. So how do you work on a short construction season? You get innovative. So what we did is we did a couple things. One, we waited until the end of the ABM treaty in June of 2002 and broke ground that day not only ceremonially, but also practically on the, uh, the interceptor communication uh, building. We built sprung structures. Leon, keep me straight where I stray here, please. But we built sprung structures, brought in heaters to heat the ground during the winter time so we could pour the foundation, built the building inside the sprung structure Sprung structure, read that as a great big tent, um, and then tore that down. And so when we tore down the, uh, the first building we started on, uh, we tore it down, I did the tour and everything. We accepted the building at two o'clock that afternoon. At four o'clock that afternoon, we started putting mission equipment into the building. That is how tight our schedule was. And the great people that worked on this program, of which there are stakeholders in here that were part of that program back then, they deserve enormous credit for what they accomplished. And so we did go operational on the 30th of September, 2004, which was the date we were told, with a margin of 27 minutes Alaska time. Last time zones were important that day. Uh, but as I told a couple folks, we had technicians inside the missile field adjusting the limit switches on the silo closure mechanism uh, at while it was snowing on the 30th out at Fort Greeley. 
We had to get them out of the missile field in order to go operational. And we did, and we had a margin of 27 minutes after 33 months. So we had a lot of great people working on it. So my lessons learned out of that. Capability-based, really important, number one. Number two, flexibility. How do you get flexible and innovative in your approaches to doing business? And then three, trust and building trust between the political leadership, the government leadership inside, and, and these folks are constrained to operate in ways that I was not constrained. But how do, you, how do you work the Pentagon? How do you work the building to be able to get the authorities that you need? Working with NORTHCOM, working with uh, SMDC, who uh, the uh, National Guard reports to when they're on duty. How does all of that come together? You gotta build trust. You gotta be credible. You gotta tell them when you got problems. We had all sorts of problems uh, and great stories coming out of many of those. But you also got to tell them when you're doing well too. And you got to educate people. And, and a subtle question or a subtle response to one of the uh, questions Ricky asked was, work not only closely with Senator Stevens, he probably went to Fort Greeley during this time frame for four times uh, and really understood what was going on. But the other important piece was his staffer, Sid Ashworth. She knew everything that was going on about missile defense. So when Senator Stevens went and said something, he was well briefed, he was well prepared, he knew the details of what he was talking about. So having critical engagement with the congressional staff, I would argue is a piece of the puzzle there in terms of answering your question. With that, I'm gonna sit down. I'll, I'll ask John, just, yeah, trust is absolutely vital. If you look back, we had failures. We had epic failures. Oh. Uh, let me just, yeah. we, we had epic failures. And the culture, however, the culture didn't didn't go risk averse on those failures. You didn't because you couldn't do what you did. But after that, we went risk adverse and our, our we slowed way down. And we've slowed way down. So when we get the new NGI coming in, what, what are the lessons? Do you have to change the culture to get the speed back? Or what would you say from your perspective on how to get the NGI Ricky, Ricky, no astro, no acronyms, and, okay. and there's few people here who don't understand NGI. <laughs> the next generation interceptor is the next missile that's that's been uh, appropriated and moving forward. So I'm just asking, John, can some of the same? Uh, can you give them the same authorities that you got? Do you think that's even possible, or what? What do you? What are your thoughts as they go forward <laughs> into? Uh, Doesn't take authorities. It takes, uh, you're, you got it right, it's a culture. Now I said we flew five flight tests in 14 months. The first four were successful, the fifth one was a failure. But when we st first started on this journey back in January of 2002, I agreed with the senior leadership that we would fly through failure. We'd keep flying. You don't go reckless on this. You, what, what people think is when you're given prerogatives, all of a sudden you're gonna be a bunch of, not to use your terminology, gangsters out there. And there are some great gangsters in the audience. But I, what I'm really telling you is the culture of flying through failure is absolutely important. Not that you're gonna freewheel everything, but let me talk about the last failure mode, that last flight test that we failed on, which was on the 6th of February, 2003. So I'm at a Kwajalein, I'm in the, uh, the control room, the target launches successfully out of Kodiak. I'm at Kwajalein, we launched the interceptor successfully, goes through first stage burn, second stage burn, and then nothing happens to separate the kill vehicle from the booster. And so the kill vehicle's never set loose to go kill the uh, reentry vehicle it's after. 
Uh, so abject flight test failure. So what caused that flight test failure? Well, we did the uh, uh, root cause analysis, and, and here's where I see the lessons learned. First, it took us about two weeks to get to root cause. Root cause was a fifth tier vendor who provided a computer board to a laser firing device and failed to conformal coat the board, which changed the resonant frequency of the board. And so the laser firing device worked for nine times perfectly, but it didn't work the last three that were required. And the reason was a lead broke because the resonant frequency changed. Well, that vendor never told anybody they changed their process. So nobody knew that it was a different process, a different part than we had flown before. So we were able to correct all of that and that was good. That's not the message that I'm giving you though. When we did the root cause analysis, we found nine other vulnerabilities. And people talk about random failures and everything when you go through all of this business. These nine things were random successes that had happened on the previous flight tests. So when we dug through it in the failure mode, we identified other critical areas that could have caused a failure. So failing a flight test is bad news. I, I've lived it, it is no fun, and it, uh, it's still etched in my brain. But what you learn from that flight test failure is more than you learn from a flight test success. Don't fail anything on me. <laughs> and I'll just leave you with one last comment. Werner von Braun, the father of uh, American uh, missilery and rocketry, how many launches did he attempt before he had a success when he came over to the US and was operating out of White Sands Missile Range? Anybody have an idea? 33, wow. just chew on that for a while. We would not have gone to the moon without Werner von Braun. If we'd fired him as the program manager after the first flight test, where would we be today? Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.